Will you open your Bibles, please, to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6? And I direct your attention to nine verses and this very familiar portion of the Word of God. If you've been saved in a length of time, you've had some exposure to this chapter, I'm sure. It deals with the preparation of a Christian to face a gainsaying, God-hating, Christ-rejecting world, and how you to arm yourself and to prepare yourself for the journey. In verse 10, Paul said to that church at Ephesus, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might, or in His strength. Now this is not just a nameless statement that the apostle is using to fill up space and to uh, occupy time. Very important. Finally, my brethren. He's trying to condition them for a situation in life that is inevitable that they're going to face. And so therefore, he's preparing them for it. And uh, certainly the Spirit of God is leading him to do it. And it's time now to do something about it. He tells them in verse 11 to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now that's why he talks to them about being strong. Because there's conflict that's coming and it's not far away yet. You need to be ready for it. All of us, when we first get saved, are totally unprepared for what's soon to come. Now, this is where you need to be preached to and to be instructed and to be taught. Because once you're saved, you start on a journey. And you need to understand that this journey has a lot of low places and turns and twists to it. And it, uh, if you're not prepared for it, then you're going to have some disastrous things to happen to you. Now, somewhere back in the past, in the church age, Somebody started teaching that uh, when this happens, you lose what you got in the new birth. And so consequently, you have to start all over again. Now, if that be true, then all of us ought to understand it. If it's not true, then we ought not to accept it. And the whole issue centers around this central truth. We must understand uh, the quality of life that God gives when we're saved. It's eternal life. It isn't temporary life contingent upon certain conditions that we meet according to stipulations in the Word. Not at all. It's free grace. And once you're saved, God gives you eternal life. Now that ought to settle some things, but that doesn't settle all things. Then we have to come to an understanding, well, if that be true, then why all of the conflicts and why all of the issues and why all of the, uh, the setbacks that we have? Well, once you understand that we're at war, it's warfare, then you're better able to understand that uh, I'm to be prepared for what's happening to me. When our men were fighting in uh, the Vietnam War and then the Korean War and World War II and World War I and other wars, they did not lose their American identity because they were fighting. They were still Americans. And I do not lose my identity as a Christian when I am in this spiritual warfare. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Now, uh, that verse really tells us that it is a spiritual warfare. But against principalities, against powers, against spirit, the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies or in high places. It is a spiritual warfare as well as a worldly conflict. If you get this, if you really understand that, then it makes it a lot easier for us in this conflict. And, and uh, you don't have these misunderstandings and everything. When I started preaching, I thought everybody uh, would be friendly and congenial and loving and kind and understanding. Uh, I, I was set up for a rude awakening. It wasn't long in my little old church that I accepted after I started pastoring uh, that uh, 
uh, conflicts and divisions arose. They were good people. Had a man, couldn't he was worked for a railroad company. He was a Christian man, and they wouldn't let him pastor. His company wouldn't, but he wanted to preach. But he didn't like what I preached and the leadership that I was providing for the church. Well, I really wasn't officially the pastor. I was uh, just really the superintendent of the Sunday school. But they had issued to me in the call that if the church grew, they would call a pastor. And it like, in all likelihood would be me if the church grew. Well, that was in the 1st of October. And uh, though I was away at school five days a week, most of the time, and only on the weekend uh, in, the, in the church, didn't have an automobile, had one little auditorium, six Sunday school rooms, very small. Uh, from the 1st of October until the 1st of February, without any buses, without any automobile of my own, the church had grown from 38 people to 140 something. So I felt it was time to call a pastor and, uh, and uh, there was conflict that arose because of that, because I was teaching tithing and this brother was preaching against it on Wednesday night when I was not there. And my wife gossiped and told me about it. You know, that's the way women do things, you know. So I decided I better do something about it. Well, when push comes to shove, I've always had the capability of doing something about it. And uh, so uh, uh, they called me as pastor on a Sunday morning, and, and uh, I started my pastor. Several people got up and walked out, but as far as I know, we didn't lose a single member. They came back, and uh, they apologized to me. said, Preacher, we really didn't. We just thought it was going to hurt the church because they'd had a split under a former pastor not long before I came. Now, with that in mind, you're going to have misunderstandings. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised when I'm talking to some women who got saved, and you and your husband used to party and everything. When you got saved, your husband became a regular little devil. You wanted to poison him almost. He, uh, he didn't, you had a happy home while you were both living in sin. But you let one get saved, and then it, then it becomes a difficulty. I contend when we're saved as husband and wife and we have a common interest, we're not going to have any conflicts to speak of. Oh, we'll have our spats and everything like that and pouty times, but it's not that difficult. Now, with this in mind, you understand some of the issues of life. Well, let me just mention another. Illness is a, is a terribly devastating thing to people. Illness. Uh, it can destroy you spiritually if you let it. Some of the most bitter people I've ever had anything to do with, people that have had illness, who were saved, and they thought God wasn't giving them a fair shake, and so they got bitter toward God. I met people like that. On the other hand, I met some beautiful people who were ill, and uh, they uh, were able to overcome their illness. One of the sweetest experiences in all of my life was in Tyler, Texas. I knew a woman. Uh, she uh, was a Methodist lady. She wasn't even a Baptist. Uh, I'm sorry about that. But anyway, because of the moral of the story, it would have been nicer if she had been a Baptist, I think. But anyway, she was one of the sweetest Christians, and she was what we call in the South bedridden. She, couldn't, uh, she could not uh, leave her bed, and she had been in that bed for 12 years. She was a beautiful Christian. Praise the Lord. She listened to me every day on radio. And I'd go by to see her because I'd led her son-in-law to Christ and her daughter. And, and it was a beautiful experience in that home. And she never one time complained. And she lived uh, on a well-traveled street and quite often. And in a little old church, I knew everybody around. So I'd drop by to visit and have prayer with her. And she was always praising the Lord. And she'd always tell me, Brother John, some of these days, God's going to let me walk again. Some of these days, God's going to let me walk again. Well, I tried to encourage her, but I, my faith wasn't nearly that strong. And you know, uh, I'm happy to tell you that her faith, God rewarded it. And uh, when she'd been confined about 15 years to the bed, suddenly that woman started improving and she was able to walk again. One of the most incredible things. And I know God is able to heal people when it pleases Him to do it. 
Now he was glorified in her illness for 15 years or thereabout. But my, what a testimony that woman had. What an encouragement. I must say after all these years that I look back upon that experience and that testimony of that woman and she really has helped my faith. And she's been in heaven a good many years now, but I mean it. She really helped my faith because in the conflicts of life, our faith sometimes, the devil does his best to destroy. When uh, Simon Peter was being sifted by Satan, the Lord Jesus said to him, I have prayed for thee for one reason. What was it? Talk back to me. That thy faith fail not. God doesn't want our faith to fail. Now, with this in mind, he tells us in this warfare, in verse 13, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. I want you to notice about four things. Verse 11 is said that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Here in verse 13, you may be able to withstand in the evil day. Uh, that's number two. Number three, and having done all, A-L-L, having done all, that's in the past. You've done everything you know to do. You've tried everything. You've done everything. Having done all to do what? Stand. And in verse 14, stand therefore. Do you realize that uh, the word stand and withstand and stand and stand therefore appears four times in this conflict, in this description here? All right, now, in the ability to do that, it's described in these next verses. It's the armor that he tells us to put on. And he tells us to put on the whole armor of God in verse 13. All right, what is the first piece of equipment? Having your loins girt about with truth. You see where truth plays an important part in this. You'll not ever be able to stand if you're not on solid ground as far as truth is concerned. Truth. Truth. You see, it's easy. Uh, tradition. Uh, I, I was uh, a member of a Baptist church that believed in a divided rapture and, and that uh, only Baptists would be a part of the bride of Christ and, and a few uh, strange things like that. And you know what? I never did believe it. I've always been an independent thinker. And uh, having that Baptist background did not make me believe that when God saves you, He gives you eternal life. The Bible made me believe that. Amen. I did not have sprinkling, although I had a Methodist Sunday school teacher, a woman that taught me uh, in Sunday school, I, uh, uh, I did not believe that a little water on my head was a picture of a burial. And according to Romans 6, the Bible taught me that it's a burial. And if it's a burial, then you need to be buried. Amen. I mean, you've got, to quit, you've got to quit tradition and believe the truth. Amen. It's the truth that you need that helps you to withstand and having done all to stand and to stand therefore. All right, now notice it. Having your loins girt about with truth, that's where you're most vulnerable. What do they tell you in boxing? Have you ever watched a referee? When uh, a boxer hits his opponent in the, in the groin or in the abdomen, he's, he, he'll uh, take points away from him if they're grading you on points. And the devil knows how to hit us in our vulnerable place. Now, he's using the body to illustrate a spiritual truth. You're going to be vulnerable somehow, some way, and you need your loins girt about with spiritual truth or else the devil will give you a, a deadly blow. Do you understand that? It's a personal thing. And I think I'm preaching to some people maybe that need this. Have your loins girt about with truth. You, your opinion doesn't amount to hell of beans as we say in the South. It's what does God say about it? Your opinions don't enter into it. What does the Word of God say? Now, of course, today with all of the translations that we have, it's a real conflict. Southern Baptists, the Southern Baptist Convention are having some powerful conflicts. If I had my say in fundamental Baptist colleges all over the country, I'd fire every, I'd fire every professor. And this program's being heard in areas where I've had a vital part in schools. I'd fire every professor that questioned the text in any way. Amen. I wouldn't mess with him 24 hours. Now, he might do it unwittingly, but I'd talk with him 
and uh, get his feelings about it because uh, I believe, watch it now, God has given his word and he's, prefer, he's preserved it, period. And that's it. And leave it at that. And that's what gives confidence. When I surrendered to preach and I struggled with this a while and it just so happened that, that uh, I had a great admiration for a man and he kept all, he, he was a great debater and he'd say, now, uh, the Greek says this, and the Hebrew says this. And he was a Greek and Hebrew scholar. He was an educated man. And he really wanted me to follow in his footsteps because he had found in a seminary, and uh, he, he was in our home and, and uh, a very personal friend of our family. But he was always saying, now, the original says this. But I wasn't dumb. I'd figured out some things out for myself. I didn't spend weeks and days on my horse out in the wilds. We had open range and I could go. I mean, there was hardly any fences from where we lived to the Mississippi River. And I mean, it was a wild country in those days. And I did a lot of thinking. God was preparing my heart to be a preacher. I was an independent thinker. And I'd hear that scholar talk about the originals, and it dawned on me that he didn't have the originals. I asked him about it. Well, he said, uh, we do not have the originals. I said to him one day, I said, well, Dr. So-and-so, why do you say the original says so-and-so whenever you don't have the originals? Amen. I mean, that messes up a scholar real quick. Amen. And I asked him that question before I ever graduated from high school. But I was thinking about that. If a man tells me something, I want him to be able to back it up. Amen. 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 What does the Word of God say? Having your loins girt about with truth. You see, you get the idea when you hear me preach that I have a Bible that is without any admixture of error whatsoever. Amen. And you can believe it. You can stake your eternal destiny upon it because it is truth. All right, God says, now if you're going to be what you ought to be as a soldier... And get your loins girt about with truth so that you'll not be carried about by every wind of doctrine. Man, that, that bothers me when I see uh, intelligent people and people that are they're wonderful people and they are wishy-washy in their, in their stability. Know what you believe and believe what you know. I heard a very well-known evangelist say some time ago that he had changed a lot of his belief. Well, I want you to look up here a minute. Turn your radio a little louder. You're listening to a man that never has changed one single solitary belief. I have enlarged upon some of them. But I take this Bible literally. I take it for what it says uncompromisingly. And I know I say things that bothers a lot of people. But I'm going to add say it them anyway. If it bothers you, so might it be. Because, honey, I want to tell you something. I'll have to answer to God someday for what I preach, not you. I don't have to go through the kitchen to get to God. I go right to the throne room. Amen. And I have the truth. And I know the truth. And I know I have to answer to God. Uh, have you ever stopped to really think about uh, this preacher of yours uh, preaching uh, well over 30,000 times that I've got to answer to God for every sermon I've ever preached and for every lesson I've ever taught? I mean, that's an awesome thing to think about. So when I tell you to do this, I mean what I say. I'm not just preaching. I mean for you to put on the whole armor of God. Do you get it? Now if you don't do it, then you're rebelling against God because God says in the word for me to tell you this is what you are to do. Man, that gets it tight, doesn't it? That's screwing the nut down to the last thread on the bolt. But that's the way it is. You say, well, I don't like that dogmatism. I do. Amen. You know, death is dogmatic. Judgment is dogmatic. Old age is dogmatic. I mean, that's it. You can't, you can't put that off. All right, now look. Have your loins girt about with truth. Having on the breastplate of righteousness. Get out there where people say it. Get out there where it'll protect you. How about an umpire behind the plate? I saw one the other day, and, and the batter fouled that ball off the bat, hit that uh, chest protector of the umpire, didn't hurt him at all. Because he was protected. 
Are you protected? Having on the breastplate of righteousness. All right, living. Get your living in harmony with your beliefs. And your beliefs in harmony with your, with your righteousness. Don't be one thing. That's what's, that's what's wrong with Jimmy Swagger. He's preaching one thing, practicing something else. Cold, hard facts. Don't you understand that? Well, you say, uh, what about uh, Mr. Swagger? If he never ever saved, he's still saved. No one's perfect. He may, have, uh, he may have had that problem for a long time. But I will say this, that every transgression and every sin will have a just recompense of reward. No one's perfect. That's where, that's where these people in the past preaching perfection is going to mess up. Because a man is perfect in the body, he wouldn't have to have glasses and wear toupees and cut off his toenails and do a lot of other things. It'd be perfect. Your body is imperfect, so you've got to get the truth out there. And your breastplate of righteousness, you need protection. You have an enemy. The world is your enemy. The flesh is your enemy. I don't have any confidence in myself. I don't have a bit of confidence in me. That'll shock you. But I sure do have confidence in the Holy Spirit who dwells in this body of mine to help me to overcome the things that have to be overcome. I think really, and honestly and truly, if it had been left up to me to preach, I never would have preached. But God said, this is the way it is. He'd call me to preach. And then I got to liking it after I got into it. That is part of it. Some of it I don't like. The Lord understands that. You know, that's why people think I'm so unusual. There's some of the ministers I don't like at all. I, I, I just don't like it. But it goes with the package. And some of this thing of being a Christian, I don't like to be castigated and scorned and made light of by a gainsaying world. I don't like that. Amen. I want to get me a pair of nuts and square off and settle the old account of some of these dudes. But I can't do that. I'm saved. And I can't even have vengeance. The Lord said, vengeance is mine. I will repay. You see, I'm being honest with you. I'm not a hypocrite in the pulpit. I'm not some pious uh, nerd that, uh, uh, that people don't have any confidence in. If you don't like it, you just, you just have to take it like it is because this is me. I know the world, know the flesh. I know all of this. I have great sympathy for people. I, I met a fellow, he's Christian, and he has an alcohol problem. I met him the other day, shook hands with him. I said, you still battling alcohol? He said, yeah, Dr. John, I really am. God love him. He, that alcohol's got in his flesh, and he's not going to be able to get rid of it, look like. I imagine I'll bury him. I bury most people. I'll get, you know, I'll have the privilege of doing that to some of you, probably. Amen? Why, Sure. So you better live right so I can say something nice about you because I'm not going to lie. <laughs> Isn't that terrible? Oh, I might say she looks natural, but that's as far as I'll go. You can get by with a lot of things. All right. That breastplate, all right, come on. Let's look at some other things. Your feet shot with the preparation of the gospel of peace. See, you're on a journey. Now, let's get this, and I don't want to be impractical and try to spiritualize things, but this is talking about a spiritual journey. And yet, uh, you need to understand that. Your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. You are in peace work. P-E-A-C-E, -E, peace work. And that's why I say that the Christian is to be a kind, considerate individual and to do what they can to help an unsaved world that don't understand Christianity. Understand that. And so it doesn't bother that much. All right, now look at it. It's your feet. You're on a journey. How far have you traveled since you became a Christian? That's a good question. How far have you traveled? Have you, have you gone a long distance? I think, I think uh, if I were to put down everything from riding a horse to uh, buses and trains and cars and planes, I think I've traveled well over five million miles since I've been a Christian, I mean, since I've been preaching. But that's not what counts. How many miles have I traveled for Jesus? I'm talking about spiritual miles. 
How much progress have I made? How, how, am I, did I stop off after I got saved? Have I made any progress? I wish you folks could really see where I came from. I mean, it, it, you'd thank God that Dr. Johns made the progress that he has. I mean, I'm honest about it. You'd be surprised where I came from. I mean, uh, uh, the background and the home I had is just as primitive as it was 200 years ago, just about it. That doesn't mean you're stupid. It just means you came up in primitive times. And to come from that to pastor one of the largest churches in the world of, of the whole 20th, uh, whole uh, 2,000 years of church age, I thank God for it. I don't have anything to brag about. I just know where I came from. Amen. Do you know where you came from? We are to remember the pit from whence we were dug and the rock from whence we were hewn. And I tell you, if you get thrilled and excited about the journey you're on, and you'd be a blessing to people, and you can help people, and you can encourage people. I meet people that I've never seen walk up to me and say, you, you won me to Christ. You helped me get saved. I, I was converted under your medicine. I'm going to preach in a church tomorrow night. And uh, I'll never forget, I was at John R. Rice in the Sword of the Lord Conference in that church. And uh, a fellow would come to the hotel, pick me up, take me on, a, on the particular morning. I'd preached the night before. And uh, when he drove up in front of that church, here's a handsome young man standing out with a Bible under his arm, well-dressed. And when the driver pulled the car up, this young man opened the door. And I got out. He reached out his hand and said, Dr. John, uh, I wanted to meet you. And, I wanted to see you again. He said, do you remember me? And I said, no, not really. He said, well, you wouldn't. And then the blessed story. What a story. I preached up here at Chautauqua Campgrounds several years prior to the story I'm telling. And a bunch of preachers had just had a, they, they'd been fighting each other. It'd been a, it, it wasn't a very spiritual time. I was to close out that youth camp that night. And I guess the Lord really, I say, I guess the Lord really knew about the bad spirit of the ministers and everything. And uh, the music director came to me and he said, Brother John said, we have a terrible spirit in the services. And uh, I, I just had learned that two of the pastors almost had a fist fight out behind the building, the tabernacle, just uh, five minutes prior, prior to that. Here I am to preach, preach the last of the meeting. And in addition to that, we'd been having storms here in the valley, and uh, there was a cloud coming up, and ah, the lightning and the thunder and, and trees all around. They're pretty dangerous. So they decided to go ahead and keep the kids under there, hundreds of kids. And uh, I, uh, you know, it is, I tried to preach, couldn't, so I just entertained them for about an hour and a half. We'd have some singing. Two hours, two hours. And I, hot and uh, lightning and uh, the storm warnings out, tornadoes all around. And I made up my mind, I said to the, uh, I said to the uh, young preacher moderating the meeting, I said, I don't care if we're here till three o'clock in the morning, I'm going to preach. I was worn out. I'd been busy all that day. And uh, I mean, hot and sultry. And the kids were uncomfortable. And, but I said, just go ahead and let's, let's keep them together. Suddenly, it just seemed like God quieted everything down. The wind died down. And I went to that pulpit and I preached as best I could. I preached about 18, 20 minutes. Gave the invitation. And we had over 300 kids coming forward in that meeting that night. Over 300. And how shall I ever forget uh, they, these, they, these, a lot of these kids out in Detroit, Michigan, they were, it was a Michigan camp. And two young men got saved. One young man, they were on dope. They thought because of the youth camp, there'd be a lot of women down there, you know, young girls. That's what they came for, for the girls. They didn't come for a spiritual meeting. They were so miserable. And of course, the camp superintendent, all of them wouldn't let the boys leave, so they had to stay there. And can you imagine being on dope? And about 18 years old, have to stay in an environment like that and having prayer in your cabin at night. I mean, these fellows nearly beside themselves. But that night, God used my message, and those fellows came forward. One of them got saved, and he went back and got his buddy, and he came. He has all been over. 
after he got saved, they came up as about five others out of that same crowd got saved. And this spokesman came up and he said, uh, he said, Reverend, you got me tonight. I said, did I? He said, yeah. He had long haired. I mean, he was using street language and said, whatever it is, you're preaching. I got it. I said, good, it'll work. Amen. I said, what's the matter with your buddy? He's all been over. He said, we had a street fight a few days ago and said, he is cut up. He just got out of the hospital. And uh, I said, you mean he's healing? He's had been a street fight. He said, yeah. And a couple of other fellows beat up pretty badly. All that crowd got saved. Now, ladies and gentlemen, the man who met me out in front of this church where I'm preaching tomorrow night was the spokesman for that crowd. And uh, he said, Dr. John, you wouldn't remember me, but I'm that uh, dope addict uh, that was saved at that Michigan camp. And he said, I'm in the ministry. I said, what happened to your buddy that was cut up? So, oh, he said, he's, in, he's been in the Air Force and he's getting out and uh, finishing up his tenure and he's going, he's going into the ministry. said, he's going to be a missionary. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that wonderful how God works? Listen, ladies and gentlemen, it pays to put on the whole armor of God and get started walking. Walking in those gospel shoes. All right, now, verse 16, above all, beyond all, above all, take the shield of faith. Now that thing, you've got to study that a little bit. You have to meditate upon that. That shield to protect you because you're going to be, you're going to be under fire. And it's called the shield of faith. Isn't that amazing? The description, the description here fascinates me. I need a shield of faith. The devil's going to try to destroy my faith. He has tried over and over and over again. Take for instance, one of the hardest things I've ever put up with in this church is trying to sell property. We've had, we've had an old building down in Lachlan for sale 25 years. I'm not going to give up until God Almighty lets us sell that property. He just might as well let us sell it because I'm not going to give up. And you know how I feel about it? That the people's tithes and offerings built that building and God wants us to get something out of it and it's become a faith thing. And I believe God eventually will reward faith and He tests our faith. He, let us, he lets us go. Uh, this is the way God works. And if you quit every time your little dab of faith gets tested, you're not going to go very far in this Christian journey. You've got to be tough. You have to be tough. Did you hear what I said? If you're going to go very far for God, you have to be tough. Now the point is this. Uh, do you quit? Do you give up? Or do you just keep progressing? I'd like to help you. I don't care how you've messed up your life. Get up again. Get up again. Keep getting up. I believe a Christian needs to tell himself every day, I'm going to get up again. I'm going to get up. I'm going to get up. That Methodist woman confined for 15 years under that bed. She said, someday I'm going to walk again. 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 And bless God, she did. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, in all of this armor that we have said about so far, let's notice now, it is qualified. God puts some things in there. Wherewith or with it, you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Or the wicked one. The fiery darts. You're going to have to be able to quench them. You're going to be shot at. And you're going to be literally destroyed if you don't do something about it. Now, let me show you something. There's a man committed. He committed fornication with his stepmother and Paul said to that church of Corinth said turn him over to the devil that the flesh may be destroyed that the soul may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus that'll blow the minds of some people but that's what Paul said about it you understand you understand the imperfections of the family of God I mean we're a pretty sorry lot but if we'll just keep getting up and keep getting up and keep getting up I'm going to shock you. I like to tell things on television and radio. I know I guess I'm already off radio. Times, well, go ahead recording it. I'll put it on anyway. We'll take out something. I was talking to a fellow in the psychiatric ward the other day, a member of our church, and he had flashbacks. And you know what? He, he said he had to have marijuana. This happened some time ago. 
and uh, acquaintance of his said, I'll tell you where you can get it. And he took him where he can get it. Do you know who had it? Member of this church. That's a crowd I have to preach to. You people think, well, Dr. John's warped. No, I'm, I'm not warped. You are. You don't understand when you get hundreds of people together what you're preaching to. Good Lord, if we had on the screen up here tonight and had you people and, and all of us and flash on the screen really what we are, we'd have a riot. There's 16 doors in this building, but we'd have a traffic jam getting out. Who are we kidding? This gang up here on the platform probably run over me. No. 